Hey there, St. Helena's. Um, this is our second attempt at our first session of our dual citizenship uh, October dinner series. Uh, we had a few technical difficulties, some of them YouTube's fault, some of them our technology's fault, some of them my fault, but they all combined and just made it really chaotic. So we decided that we just record this session and we'll make it available online uh, and get it out to y'all then. So if you tried watching it live, thanks for bearing with us. Uh, we'll iron this all out for next week and hopefully have a little more luck and a little more fun. So, it's the devil, I'm sure. I think so. The devil's in the technology. I think so. I think so. Um, well, and so let's start with a prayer because uh, prayer always helps. So, yeah. Uh, this is a prayer for the upcoming presidential election. Uh, so let us pray. Almighty God, to whom we must account for all our powers and privileges, guide the people of the United States in the election of a president. Bless the nominees, Donald Trump and Joe Biden, Mike Pence and Kamala Harris, and pour your grace upon their families. Grant that we might receive a president who by faithful administration and wise governance may protect the rights of all citizens, unify our nation, and fulfill your purposes for this country. And all this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So welcome, welcome to um, the first of our uh, three-week series called Dual Citizenship Conversations about Christian Responsibility in an Election Year. Uh, we chose the theme Dual Citizenship, uh, and it comes out of Scripture uh, in Paul writing to the Christians at Philippi in the third chapter in the 20th verse of Philippians. Uh, Paul uses this phrase that our citizenship is from heaven. In several other places in his writings, he talked about Christians being ambassadors for Christ. And in that imagery, Paul is clearly acknowledging the reality that we all know, and that is the people who follow Jesus really have dual citizenship. We are citizens of the kingdom of God, uh, and then we are also citizens of whatever nation uh, in which we live and move and have our being. So in our case, we're citizens of the kingdom of God, and we are citizens of these United States. And sometimes there's tension that happens when you have dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. There are demands and there are values and there are tensions in that. And so we thought uh, with this incredible election process, which our nation finds ourselves uh, and all that's happening, uh, good and bad and ugly uh, around <laughs> uh, the election year this year and all the tension and uh, debate and sometimes downright hate, uh, that we ought to have a voice as Christians in this conversation. So we put these together to talk about uh, that dual citizenship. Uh, Brian was looking at some statistics this morning uh, that we thought were interesting, so I thought we'd share them. It was the American uh, Psychological Association, the APA, put out a study just this morning that said 68% of Americans are stressed out about the election. So more than two-thirds of Americans, more than two-thirds of the people in the pews, um, you know, two, stats say one of us is stressed out about the election. Right, right. So we thought it'd be good to, uh, to put this together. Uh, to talk just a little bit about uh, some logistics of how we're going to do this. So we have turned off the live stream comments mm -hmm. feed. So if you comment, uh, we can't see it. Uh, and we did that because when we live stream, anybody in the world can post anything uh, on our live stream. And we thought that could be a little dangerous, uh, yeah. <laughs> talking about politics and who knows what might come up. Um, and so we've turned that off, but we would love to hear from you. So uh, feel free to email us. We won't check our email while we're talking, but tonight and tomorrow and the days ahead, we'll be, we'll be checking it. If you have questions, or maybe there's something you want us to say more about next week, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you're upset about something, Brian would love to hear from you. He would love to get lengthy, angry emails from you. Yeah. So send them to cure at and We'd be happy to hear from you. But we do want to hear from you, and we do want to try to respond to you. So feel free to communicate with us, and we'll try to uh, make that a two-way conversation. And then finally, in terms of logistics, uh, anytime you talk about church and politics, uh, sometimes it makes people really uncomfortable. And uh, so we hope that in the next, uh, these three sessions, that there are times when you're a little uncomfortable. Uh, that you're upset or you're thinking about something we said or 
it's awkward. Uh, and that's a good sign. It means that the, the gospel uh, is clashing with us and sometimes our preconceived notions or things we've held that we haven't really thought about in a while. Mm -hmm. So we hope every once in a while that uh, you feel a little uncomfortable. Uh, and, and, if, and if that's true, then that's good. That means yeah. God's working on you and the Holy Spirit's you know, molding and fashioning you and making you think. And we hope that's good. So. Yeah, if you, if you watch through all these and just feel really comfortable and feel like we're reaffirming uh, everything that you already believe, um, you know, maybe watch it again. Yes, or maybe <laughs> we need to dig deeper or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the question we want to address tonight is the question, uh, should the church be involved in politics? Uh, which is a question we get fairly often. Should the church be involved in politics? Yeah, so I'm playing around with this slideshow here. We had all sorts of polls that we were going to do, and we'll save them for next week. So that central question of should the church be involved in politics, um, you know, I've heard often, you know, this is uh, one of our favorite complaints to get as preachers is, you know, that sermon was too political. Right. Uh, and sometimes we'll hear that. Sometimes we'll hear about things in the national church or, you know, in our church or other churches in town, and people will lament the fact that, you know, either politics has gotten involved in our church or our church has gotten involved in politics. Um, you know, where have you heard some of those statements before? Uh, pretty often, you know, occasionally I'll hear somebody, somebody will come to me because uh, the national church, the residing bishop or the general convention or our Dawson bishop or another pastor in town uh, said something and the person will come to me and say, uh, so-and-so said such and such, um, that was very political. Why are they, is the church getting involved in politics? Or during an election year, pretty often, somebody will come to me and say, you know, so-and-so is clearly the only really candidate for Christians. When are you going to preach about that on Sunday morning or teach about it in a Sunday school? Because there really is no other option mm -hmm. for Christians. I've heard that over the years. Yeah, sometimes I hear people say, too, you know, the church is really just about all that spiritual stuff. You know, it's a me and Jesus, or, you know, about saving souls and going to heaven and all that dirty, messy, worldly politics, you know, that's not what the church is there for. You know, we should rise above all of that. Right. Um, and it got me thinking a little bit about, you know, what even are politics? What does the word politics mean? And really, at the end of the day, politics are just the rules and the systems that we have to organize our common life together. It's a way that we can get a bunch of different people together and treat each other fairly uh, and ensure that voices are represented and that you know everyone's taken care of. So politics are about ordering our common life and it made me think a little bit about our church on Sunday mornings because we pray out of a book of common prayer which orders and governs you know, our worship together to ensure that we can, a bunch of different people can all come together and pray in the same language and in the same way that we can find a way to get along. So I think part of what we do in church is similar to what we do in politics. And that means that politics then, you know, of course refers to this election and everything that entails, but it refers as well to the politics of right here in Bernie. You know, it can refer to politics within a household or a workplace or a school district. Uh, and it doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Politics, again, you know, it's just how we get along how a bunch of people, what systems they can put together so that they can live together well. And oftentimes when we use politics as a bad word, when we say, you know, oh, that's just too political, what we mean is often that's too partisan. Or sometimes, you know, that's a political view that I don't agree with and it makes me uncomfortable. And we'll call it political, but what we really mean is, you know, this is challenging my political ideas and I don't like that discomfort. And I wish that discomfort wasn't there. But I think a lot, of our, a lot of our lives are wrapped up in politics, again, not in a bad way, just right. of how do different people get along uh, and live together well. So as we're asking this question, should the church be involved in politics? Uh, I like to do what I usually do when I face a really big question. Uh, I turn to scripture and I see if there's any wisdom I can find in the Bible that might be able to get me started. So I'm gonna switch us over to the slides. You can still hear us talking. Uh, and you can just imagine that I am waving my hands as wildly as I normally do. So what does the Bible say about the church and politics? 
And first on, this is just a few list of Bible verses, but there are dozens and dozens and dozens of other ones we could have uh, come up with. And I put that verse from Philippians there that talks about our citizenship in heaven. Uh, and I also, I pulled this verse out of Exodus. In the Exodus story, Moses and Aaron go as the representatives of God's people, and they go to Pharaoh, who's, you know, the king, the president, the head honcho of the whole Egyptian empire. And they say to Pharaoh, let my people go. God says, let my people go. And I've been listening to a podcast with uh, the presiding bishop, Michael Curry, and he compares the scene in Exodus uh, kind of to the civil rights era. It's the sense mm -hmm. of, you know, negotiating, a group of people negotiating with those in power to secure liberation and freedom for themselves. And the whole sequence of the miracles and the plagues, can, you can see it as part of these ongoing negotiations um, mm -hmm. of, you know, how do, we, how do we find our freedom? And then in Matthew, uh, this reading is going to come up in the lectionary, uh, you know, just a week from Sunday. Uh, the Pharisees are asking Jesus if, you know, people should pay their taxes to the Roman Empire. They think it's a trick question. And Jesus answers them by saying, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. So it seems like Jesus is saying, pay your taxes. That's a pretty political statement. In Romans 13, Father David and I spoke about this uh, just a few weeks back in our Romans Bible study. Paul writes that people should be subject to their governing authorities, that God is the true authority and God has set up all human authorities. And so we should follow them because they've been instituted by God. You know, it's really affirming kind of worldly political systems. But then, you know, this passage from Daniel is one of my favorite Sunday school stories, mm -hmm. uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, and they are, you know, they're political officials. They're appointed, they're Jews who are appointed by the king to govern the affairs of the province of Babylon. And when the king commands that they should worship his gods, and they rebuke him, and they say, we're not going to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. They say, we're not going to serve your gods, King Nebuchadnezzar. You know, we're going to serve our god. So you get this instance where political, you know, there's drama and court intrigue. And this instance, again, of God's people pushing back against their rulers, back against the government authorities. And I'm struck overwhelmingly by how much this language of lord and king and kingdom and nation, you know, this language is found all throughout scripture, and it's really political language. When we say that Jesus is Lord, uh, we're confessing that somebody else is not. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I like to think about what do we see in church history? Uh, and I'll give you a super brief summary of some of these bullet points. You know, just moments, snapshots from church history that show you different pictures of how the church interacted with politics and government. Uh, the Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Christianity became a state religion. In the Vatican, uh, we see that the Holy See where, you know, the Pope lives is outside of any nation. It's the idea that it's its own kind of political reality, and especially in those early centuries of the church, it acted almost as a nation, as part of, you know, mm -hmm. diplomacy and, you know, mediating between different nations. The Protestant reformers, many of them in Germany and Switzerland, were wrapped up in their own political turmoil. Uh, they were working with their city-states and princes, and as much as it was a contest over kind of theological ideas, there were also political ideas too. Uh, how does the church react uh, with the government? You know, and especially a new model apart from sort of a centralized you know, Catholic, Roman uh, regime. The Church of England, of course, is, you know, kind of our ancestor church uh, as Episcopalians, and it came about in the Protestant Reformation as a national church. Uh, the, the monarch of England is the head of the Church of England, uh, and the idea there is that, you know, the Church of England is, the again, sort of like Constantine, the official church of our nation. Mm -hmm. The Puritans were persecuted by the Church of England, so they fled uh, when they could to the New World because they wanted to create a, a, new, a new community 
where they had freedom to worship the ways that they wanted to. It was uh, sort of this govern, this sense that government shouldn't be involved in forcing us to worship one way or another. And that you know, strain of an idea is enshrined in our Constitution and our Bill of Rights as the Founding Fathers made it clear that in the United States of America, the government shall not enforce any one particular religion as a national religion. Any person in this country should be able to worship in whatever way uh, they choose. I think too about the German church struggle, which is yeah. uh, Germany in the 1930s and 40s with the rise of Hitler and the Nazi party. And some of the German churches supported Hitler and the Nazis, and some of them pushed back against him. And it, there was this real search for the conscience of the church as they figured out, you know, what is our responsibility uh, faced with this new political regime? Uh, and there are a few figures who came to mind as well. There's Ambrose of Milan, uh, who was a, an early bishop. And when the Roman emperor of his time committed a massacre, he excommunicated him and withheld communion until the emperor would repent and do penance. And the emperor did repent and do yeah. penance. And it was this remarkable moment where, you know, the mighty emperor of this world-spanning empire, you know, knelt and, you know, put on sackcloth, sackcloth and, and ashes. ashes. Yeah. Uh, at the behest of a bishop. Another bishop, Archbishop Thomas Becket of Canterbury, was assassinated by the king uh, over a dispute of taxes and the question of church authority versus state authority. Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer was part of that German church struggle, and he was implicated in a plot to assassinate Hitler. So you have one clergy person who's assassinated by the, the ruling leaders, and another clergy person who's trying to do the assassination. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, as part of civil rights, you know, you have an instance here where he's a well-respected clergy person who's involved in this massive movement, this protest movement, mm -hmm. looking for freedom and liberation and human rights um, for black folks in the United States. And Archbishop Oscar Romero um, served in El Salvador and he was killed while performing mass um, yeah. by you know, his political opponents. So we can see throughout church history, right, there have been different relationships, times when the church and state are close together, times when they are far apart. There are times when you know, individuals in the church work well with the state or when they push back against the state and challenge it. So there, it's this really diverse witness of all the different ways that... Um, we could see a relationship between the church and state. And clearly throughout all of this, the one thing that was clear to me as I did my homework was that the church is involved in politics throughout scripture and throughout history. True. Um, so what about today? Should the church remain involved in politics? What do you think, Father David? I think so, and I don't, uh, you know, there's this entire conversation uh, happening about how our nation should be governed or how our community should be governed, and for the church to be uh, absent from that conversation um, is a little bit of a scary thought uh, mm -hmm. to me, that we should uh, uh, not be able to weigh in as the people of God um, and um, with the values of the kingdom of God uh, and, and try uh, to uh, have them woven into the life of our, our communities. Uh, it's a scary thought that the church would have no voice uh, in that. Um, it's interesting to me, quite often when somebody comes to me who's upset about uh, the church being too political, oftentimes I'll quote, you know, well, what about separation of church and state? Or sometimes I'll say the opposite. What about freedom of religion? Mm -hmm. um, and one nation under God. Sometimes I get quotes like that. Um, and uh, it's always interesting to me that pretty often we uh, begin our argument or our debate about the relationship about whether the church should be involved in politics or not, and we begin from the sort of uh, the state side of the argument, uh, from the sort of constitutional kind of phrases, separation of church and state and things like that, which, by the way, is not in the Constitution, uh, that phrase. Um, and um, But as uh, Christians, you know, we might want to start from the other side of, of the debate. We might want to start from the church side uh, mm -hmm. the question about should the church be involved in politics. Um, and uh, 
we might uh, want to start from the church side, and we might want to ask questions like, um, are there stories from Scripture that enlighten our understanding uh, of the role of Christians in any nation? Uh, how does the church's tradition guide us in terms of our moral responsibilities as Christians uh, in this land? Um, what does human reason tell us? For example, if we say the church should not be involved in politics, uh, what are we saying is the role of the church and what is not the role of the church in our society? And pretty often, uh, in not so much in the church realm, but in the community realm, I'll hear people talk about separation of church and state or freedom of religion and the way they interpret that is not so much freedom of uh, freedom of religion, but freedom from religion, mm -hmm. as if there should be absolutely no uh, hint of any religion uh, in the public life of America. Uh, and I'm pretty sure our founding fathers did not have that idea that uh, there should be a, a total vacuum of religion or religious conversation or values uh, in any of the public life uh, in our country. Uh, so the answer to the question, should the church be involved in politics um, and should the church endorse a political candidate or a political party or a platform, uh, the general answer is, is yes, the church should be involved in politics uh, in certain ways mm -hmm. uh, and probably not in <laughs> other ways. Um, and uh, so I kind of wanted to start with the question, because it's an easier question, I think. Uh, should the church ever endorse a political candidate or endorse a political party and say, you know, should I stand up on Sunday, as sometimes they went, somebody asked me, and, and say, you know, you should vote for this person. They are the candidate. Um, and most of the time, the answer to that is, is no. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the church should not endorse a political candidate. And, and here's why. Uh, I think that that's true. Um, each candidate uh, may have certain Christian values uh, as part of their uh, speech making, their own personal platform, or even their party's uh, platform. They might have initiatives like health care. Uh, you know, Jesus was a healer. Health care is, is a Christian value. They might have uh, be against the death penalty or pro-life. Uh, they might have social justice initiatives, all of which are part of the values of the kingdom. Um, but there is no candidate um, who fully and clearly expresses the Christian teaching in all of its totality. They may have parts of it woven in there and values woven in there. Uh, and they may or may not be churchgoers even. Uh, but there's no candidate that fully expresses uh, the width and breadth of the teaching of the church. Uh, and, um, and so uh, we have to look at where, what does their platform say as Christians? Uh, and the same is true for political parties. Uh, each party may have certain Christian values in their platforms, uh, but no political party clearly and fully expresses the world that Jesus describes in the Gospels uh, and the way we think about uh, the ideals, the vision of the kingdom on earth. No party uh, has captured that. They may have little pieces of it here and there, uh, but they're not on the same plane as, as the vision of the kingdom of God uh, on earth. So again, um, uh, endorsing a party is probably almost a never. Um, um, a couple other points to think about. Uh, it is not a sin <laughs> to vote for any candidate. Uh, Republican, Democratic, Independent. Uh, it's not sinful. Every once in a while I hear that uh, from, from others. Uh, at the same time, there is no candidate that is God's endorsed chosen candidate. Mm -hmm. and God has not let us know that. Um, and so there's not one that you know, fully has the endorsement of God. Um, and I think the other is Christians should be really careful to uh, not to make just one value in a candidate or a party's platform the single reason they vote for that person or party. Uh, we should uh, be more than one issue uh, voters as Christians because uh, there's a whole lot more to the kingdom of God than one particular value. Um, 
And so what does that mean? It means uh, that each Christian uh, should be an informed citizen, should be an informed voter. Uh, we should do our homework. Mm -hmm. uh, we should read platforms. We should listen to speeches. Uh, we should be really careful uh, to go to the source and not be informed by what other people say mm -hmm. is somebody's platform or by how other people interpret somebody's speech. Uh, God's given us the gift of reason, and we do have the ability to think for ourselves and do our homework. And then we have to pray about that, and we have to listen to our conscience. And then go vote. You know? yeah. Go vote. Yeah. Uh, you have a gift of freedom in our country that uh, isn't true for every people under the sun. Yeah, so go vote. You know? Do your homework. Be an informed citizen. Uh, and go vote. Listen to your conscience and go vote. Um, and then finally, I kind of want to make an exception to the rule, because I'm an Episcopalian, and, <laughs> and we kind of have this via media uh, between two extremes sometimes. Uh, and I do believe there are certain times in history when the church probably should endorse a political candidate. What I mean by that is there may be times at some time in the future in our nation's history, or our state's history, or our local politics, uh, where we are faced with a person who is running for leadership, running for political office, who holds a very extreme position that is very opposite of the kingdom of God. For example, if somebody was a neo-Nazi and they ran for political office, or somebody was a white supremacist and they ran for political office, or a person who ran a campaign about oppressing uh, freedom of religion, uh, as part of their platform, then the church might really feel it needs not be silent and needs to endorse a candidate. It kind of goes back to what Father Brian was saying about the history of the church in Germany uh, mm -hmm. as uh, Nazis and, and Hitler came to power. And sadly, too often the church was silent sometimes mm -hmm. uh, as that was happening around them. Uh, so there may be occasions, and I'm not saying that is happening right now, but there may be occasions where the church does say, this is not a good choice. You know, mm -hmm. you know, we need to be over here on this issue. Yeah. So let me turn that over to, to talk about a little bit about um, going back to the question. Should the church be involved in politics? Yeah. And it's, uh, right, if anything's really clear to me right now, it's that the answer is kind of complicated and it makes me uncomfortable, right? Because I think that, you know, when we look at the, the different candidates and the different political parties and you say, well, none of these fully capture Jesus' vision for the kingdom of heaven, but that doesn't mean that we should give up on the whole project entirely, right? right it right. doesn't mean that neither of them are worth voting for, but it means that I have to do the hard work of discernment and prayer and talking and listening um, to figure out, you know, who best um, in any given election or any given moment uh, might put us towards that trajectory. Um, and you might be wondering then, you know, if, so if the church is supposed to be involved in politics, you know, what kinds of things do we do? How do we get politically involved? And let's see if I can bring my slide back up here. Look at that. <laughs> All right, uh, just a little head in the corner. Uh, how can Christians be politically involved? There's a ton of options. As Father David said, the first most important one is go and vote. Uh, it's such an amazing privilege and gift that we have. Um, and we'll talk about it more in future sessions of this class, um, more specifically. Uh, but, you know, voter registration descended in Texas. Early voting opens on October 13th, uh, which is next Tuesday. So uh, there are lots of opportunities to get involved there. Uh, you can be politically involved by having hard conversations. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I am hard to have a conversation with, as so often <laughs> happens in our political discourse. It means being willing to be vulnerable and uncomfortable to, you know, really get to the bottom of how somebody else thinks and feels and try and figure out why you think and feel the ways that you do. You can write letters to your elected officials. Uh, you can listen to people with different opinions from you. You know, go out of your way to find news sources that you don't agree with uh, just to see where other people are at. You can participate in nonviolent protests, you know, marches, walkouts, sit-ins. That's a large part of the history of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, you can stay well informed. You can lobby the government. And some people even serve as elected officials. Yeah. Uh, one of our own city council members 
here is also leading music for us on Sunday morning. Um, and we have members of our church serving a school board. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you might get the call to uh, serve in your community or state even or beyond. Yeah. And as we think about these, you know, these are always for us to get involved. And what do we want to get involved for? You know, we really want to present, in presenting our voice on politics, we really want to be lifting up the things that Jesus cared about, right? The policies that should matter to us as Christians should match up with the things that we see reflected in Scripture. Uh, and that's a huge list, right? There's so much that God speaks to, um, you know, the dignity of human life, how we treat the poor, the widow, the orphans, the homeless, uh, religious freedom, racial reconciliation, promoting peace, uh, both at home and abroad, uh, you know, really prioritizing good education and, you know, looking towards restoring our justice system to make it fair and equitable and restorative rather than punitive. Uh, we want to give people employment opportunities. We want to give everyone a chance to secure housing. Uh, we want a health care system that really takes care of people. You know, at the end of the day, Jesus' ministry was all about healing. Um, so health care should matter to us. Uh, all throughout Scripture, God talks about how we treat the alien and the stranger. Uh, so how do we treat immigrants? And neither of those are, you know, political partisan issues that fit into one candidate's platform or another. You know, they're realities of our common life together. And politics is how we think about ordering them. So as we get politically involved, we want to think about these things that God cares about and be engaged in a way that helps us lift those up and hopefully get those needs met um, to care for our communities. I think... Yeah, I have another list here. Uh, so something that you might not know about, well, that's, there's my list. <laughs> something you may not know about, uh, I didn't know about this until I went to seminary for my Anglican year, to, you know, to be ordained as an Episcopalian. We have an Office of Government Relations. Right. Um, so and you wanna tell me a little bit about that? Sure, so in Washington, D.C., the Episcopal Church has uh, an Office of Government Relations, uh, which is a probably a really nice way to say uh, it's a lobby organization um, and it lobbies Congress and the president um, on legislation coming up before uh, the House and the Senate uh, and that is legislation about some of these values that Brian named, things like human life and health care and uh, immigration and religious freedom and things like that. And um, they take um, the... Um, uh, the values created by the General Convention of the Episcopal Church and policies created by the General Convention, and they uh, lobby Congress about those so that they have a try to have a voice in the creation uh, and adoption of government policy. And Episcopalians aren't the only ones who do that. The Roman Catholic Church does that. Other denominations do that. Um, uh, American Jews do that. So it's not just an uh, Episcopal thing, but there are several churches and denominations that have. Uh, lobbying in Congress. Um, and then, of course, we have this really unique um, opportunity as Episcopalians that in Washington, D.C., the National Cathedral uh, is the Episcopal the Cathedral of the Diocese of Washington, D.C. And it has this you know, incredibly unique role in history and in political life. And there are often um, speeches given there by presidents. There are often presidential funerals held there, Woodrow Wilson is buried there, um, and, uh, and it has a voice in the, in the uh, conversation going on in the nation sometimes because of its prominence in the city of uh, Washington, D.C., and so pretty often you see it on the news because something is happening, mm -hmm. and that's the platform or the place uh, where it's happening, which is pretty cool, and it's a cool place to visit if you've never yeah. been there. Well worth the trip. Really you should go. Gorgeous building. Yeah, it's really a cool place. So, and I think it speaks to our Anglican heritage a bit too that, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, the Episcopal Church being the national church of our country uh, and not in the way that, you know, all Americans should be Episcopalians, um, but in the way that we particularly uh, want to be part of the conscience of our nation, 
and that we don't want to be afraid about engaging in the political realities of our common life. Uh, so, you know, hopefully elevate both our church and worship, but also elevate, you know, our political conversations. Mm -hmm. You may or may not know that the Anglican Communion, of which the Episcopal Church is one province, uh, has an envoy to the United Nations uh, that is president of New York of the United Nations and in conversation uh, with world leaders uh, about things that matter to God, uh, things that matter to Jesus and in, in the Anglican Episcopal way of, of living those things out. And, um, and so there's a voice in the United Nations uh, from your church, uh, the Episcopal Church that's part of the Anglican Communion, which is kind of cool to think that there's somebody there having conversations in hallways yeah. and meeting with dignitaries and, and world leaders sometimes uh, to lend a voice into that political conversation. Yeah. So I put a, a few links up on the screen here. Here, look at that. Um, <laughs> so, and this is the website for the Office of Government Relations. Um, and there's two parts of it I wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, I really like their action alerts because it shows you what the Episcopal Church is lobbying for, and you can sign up to get email alerts from them. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not partisan stuff, they're, they're not endorsing candidates or anything like that, but they choose some of those issues that we talked about that, you know, that we see throughout scripture that matter to God, and they find ways to lobby the United States government. And they have a really cool system where you can, you know, they'll pre-generate a letter for you to send to your representatives. Um, so it's something that I try to make a point of, you know, when issues come up, I get them in my inbox and I see, mm -hmm. oh, you know, uh, this would be, I care about this, this would be really good. Uh, it's very easy, it doesn't take a, a lot of time for me to send off a pre-generated letter to my representatives telling them, you know, as an Episcopalian, this is what I think and this is how I feel about this issue uh, or this piece of legislation. They also have another tab for civic engagement and this is all about the election. So it's all about equipping you with the tools and resources you need to vote, uh, to have hard conversations, and to try and be a healing voice uh, in our national conversation. You know, how can we reach across divides and you know, really make a commitment to each other, both now and after the election, uh, that we really are one people. And there's some prayers on there too, on that, on that side as well. Yeah, there's some good prayers. There's like there's a ton of stuff there. So if you're interested in more information, you want to kind of explore a little bit about you know what does the national church do as part of its political involvement. Uh, I encourage you to go and check those out. So to sum it up for uh, tonight, you know the question: Should the church be involved in politics? Uh, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the church should be involved in politics. Not necessarily partisanship, as Brian <laughs> said, but in, in the political life of our country because uh, the values of our national life and what happens in our country matter to God. Um, and so they matter to us as Christians. And so, yes, we should be involved in the political life, the organizational life, the legal life of our, of our country. Um, uh, but should we endorse individual candidates? Probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, probably not, unless there's some extremism happening. Um, and so you will not hear Brian or I uh, on this coming Sunday endorsing uh, any mm -hmm. of the nominees for uh, president or vice president or uh, any of the other offices that are going to be on the ballot in November. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, do your homework, um, be an informed citizen, uh, say your prayers, listen to your conscience, uh, and go vote. Yeah, uh, Go vote. Uh, next Wednesday, we'll be back again, hopefully live streaming and not recording, uh, <laughs> hopefully without any technical difficulties. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get the devil out of uh, the wiring uh, by next week. Um, and uh, kind of the topic we'll start off next week is uh, which party do Christians belong to? Which party do Christians belong to? And so we'll tackle that one. And uh, again, we'd love to hear from you. Send us some feedback if you'd like. And thank you, thank you for uh, listening to us for a little while tonight. Uh, God bless you and your family and your household, and we hope to see you really soon. Take care, all.